Thank you, Vice President uh, Pablo, for those uh, welcoming remarks. I would like to now introduce the moderator for our first panel this evening, titled Health, Mental Health, and Disability. Professor Zing Ma is an assistant professor at the Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy, and Practice. In her research, Professor Ma examines how cultural, political, economic, and technological factors shape and design and implementation of social policies focusing on contemporary China. In a recent book, she, which exam, examines families' involvement in the care and management of persons diagnosed with serious mental illnesses. Uh, she also examines the lives and rights of people with disabilities in China. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ma to the stage and to introduce the panel. Good evening, everyone. Um, so let me begin by doing a little bit of a self-description uh, because this is a panel um, about health and disability. So I am a Chinese woman uh, with shoulder long hair and um, wearing a pair of glasses and also a pink jacket and a navy blue dress. It's my honor today to be moderating this very important panel on health, mental health and disability in China and the United States. Um, so both the U.S. and China have made significant changes to their health systems in recent years. In the United States, access to health care is highly variable, with most working age adults receiving health insurance through their employers and government support for health care largely targeted toward the poor through Medicaid and the elderly through Medicare. The Affordable Care Act, ACA, passed under the Obama administration has expanded health care coverage for the low-income population significantly, but it has fallen short of universal coverage and has been subjected to ongoing political and legal challenges. China, meanwhile, has been aggressively pursuing policies to provide universal coverage through the expansion of medical insurance, is establishing a primary health care service and a national system for access to medication, reforming public hospitals, and equalizing access in rural and urban areas. Nowadays, over 95% of the Chinese population has health insurance coverage. But challenges remain in both countries with regard to access, quality, equality, and comprehensiveness. Also, if we think about health and well-being more broadly, the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, passed in 1990, prohibits discrimination against persons with disabilities and imposes accessibility requirements in many public domains. Meanwhile, China ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, UNCRPD, in 2008, and the United States has signed but not ratified uh, this convention. So in this panel, we hope to explore some of the approaches, provisions, successes, and challenges in each country with regard to addressing the population's health, mental health, and disability needs and uh, supports. With that introduction, let me uh, welcome the panelists. I'll be brief in terms of introducing them. You can read about their uh, achievements more uh, in our brochure. Um, and first, let me welcome Dr. Cui Fengming. Uh, Dr. Cui is the director of the China program at the Harvard Law School Project on Disability. She's also an adjunct professor of Renmin University of China Law School and a senior fellow at the Renmin University of China Disability Law Clinic. Her main scholarly interests include rights to inclusive education, comparative research on best practices in inclusive education, disability studies, inclusion, and law, disability laws and policies in China, family involvement and systems of support, the development of disability-related organizations for disability rights, and the disability and general social development. And second, we have Professor Colleen Grogan um, from the Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy, and Practice. Um, she is also the, the academic director of the Graduate Program in Health Administration and Policy, and also the executive committee uh, a member of the Center for Health Administration Studies here at the University of Chicago, and an associate uh, editor of the American Journal of Public Health. And, um, and the third, 
uh, speaker that we have um, is Professor Li Ling from, um, the, uh, from Peking University. She's the Mulan Chair Professor of Economics um, at the National School of Development and also the director of the China Center for Health Development Studies at Peking University. Um, so, and uh, lastly, we have Professor uh, Harold Pollack from uh, the University of Chicago. She is a, 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 he is the Helen Ross Professor um, at the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice and the Affiliate Professor at the uh, Biological Science Collegiate Division and uh, the Department of Public Health Sciences at the UFC. He is also the co-founder of the UChicago Crime Lab and the co-director of the University of Chicago Health Lab. Again, I apologize for not being able to introduce very comprehensively your achievements. Please, re uh, please refer to the brochure for more details. And um, please join me in welcoming all the distinguished panelists. So our uh, structure of discussion today is like this. Um, I will be asking a few questions um, in the first 40 minutes or so um, for the initial discussion. And later on, um, we will be opening the floor for the audience me members and also the panelists to ask questions uh, to, uh, uh, related to our topic. So my first question today, um, also in lieu of um, self discrimination, uh, sorry, self uh, uh, introduction is a question about uh, our definition of health and well-being. This is a panel on health and uh, mental health and disability, and um, but everybody I think defines health and mental health and disability slightly differently. So I would like to start uh, by asking, what does health and well-being mean to each panelist, and? How does your work address this particular definition of health and well-being? Uh, with that, I would like to invite Prof uh, Dr. Tui to address this question. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, so before I start, I want to describe how I look like. And uh, I am uh, like an Asian, Chinese, uh, have brown hair, a pair of glasses, and yellow skin. I wear. Uh, a purple scarf. <laughs> um, so to address the question, and the question brought me uh, to my memory of um, a conversation between two persons with uh, vision impairments. Uh, let's call the first person A. A was born with an uh, abnormal eyeball condition, so that uh, gives him um, vision impairments. B became visually impaired because of a chronic disease. So they were having um, a debate about health and disability in the training under the same topic. Um, so A thinks that he is visually impaired, but quite healthy. Um, but B thinks that he is ill, but um, not disabled. So their conversation and their debate is in the classic example of issues revealing disability and health and definition issues. Um, so in my experience of working with people with disabilities and uh, in the health and mental health um, situations, most of the people uh, with and without disabilities um, in a context where disability um, is more regarded as a medical um, issue, thinks that disability, people with disabilities are not healthy and uh, they are abnormal. Um, this is uh, quite common. Even those uh, with uh, disabilities, they think the same way. Um, so how to define health? Um, I'm going to define health in the context of disability. I think uh, makes a lot of sense um, in today's topic. Uh, first of all, health is a human rights issue. I came from law school. Um, so um, my research is focused on disability human rights. Um, so health is a, is a human rights issue. It's clearly underscored in the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities in Article 25. But rights in health is not limited to Article 25. It's through the whole convention, and especially in um, Article uh, 8, 
about awareness raising in the preamble and other articles. Um, and the second one is health. The definition of health, it's the same as the definition of disability. It's an evolving issue. Um, it's socially and culturally and politically constructed. Um, in the preamble of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, disability was described as an evolving concept. It's an interaction between people with impairments and their attitudinal and environmental barriers um, when they try to pursue effective and equal participation in society on the basis, on the equal basis with others. And the health um, the definition of health is the same. It's socially constructed, but in the context where um, disability is regarded as a medical condition and the health is more constructed as a medical issue for people with disabilities. Um, so that's something we need to be aware of. And the third one is that um, disability, when you define health, it should focus on the person itself, not the disorder or the disease. Yes, uh, <clears throat> this is also emphasized in the International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health, ICF, under uh, WHO. Um, so when we define health, it includes mainly physical health, mental health, and also social health. And social health talks about how a person, a human capacity can adapt to a health condition. So when we define health, it's not talking about an absence of a disorder or a disease, it's human capacity to adapt to those challenges and the self-management. On the society side, it's to remove social barriers for people with disabilities to have equal access to uh, medical conditions and health services, uh, health uh, protections and benefits. And when we think about it, it's not difficult to uh, describe. When we think about people with disabilities, they are more vulnerable to po uh, poverty, sanitation issues, education issues, and then impair their life development. So they are more vulnerable to uh, fall into unhealthy conditions, but those are not attributed to disability itself, but social and attitudinal barriers that creates society barriers and to impair people with disabilities. And so if we think about health as an definition that's socially and uh, culturally constructed. And we can see disability as someone in a disease or disorder condition, but with human capacity to manage, to pursue fulfillment and their well-being in spite of those challenges. And this is a new trend to define health. So that uh, provides a perfect leeway for me to talk about well-being. I think well-being um, includes your dignity and your rights to make decision for your life, your rights to have equal participation in society, and your ways to contribute society in a very unique and purposeful ways in spite of your um, disability or uh, other health conditions. So um, I will pause over here and uh, would love to hear yeah. others. And uh, Professor Paul, what, what do you want to be what a, what, what a nice uh, uh, encapsulation of, of these issues. So I'll, I'll be, I, I think you covered many of the things that I would say. I should say I'm a five foot seven uh, Caucasian man. I have high face validity to be a nerdy professor for those of you that <laughs> may be listening. Uh, hey, I haven't gotten to the joke yet. The, uh, but, um, and, and um, uh, when I think about health and well being, when I think about uh, I, I, my doctoral student, Tony Sadler, was uh, reminding me of Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum's uh, fantastic work about the, the centrality of sort of functioning to achieve your aspirations and your goals in your life. 
And I often, I'm, I'm extremely myopic. And in another, in another context with another set of technologies, I would be considered disabled. In the in the context that I live in right now, it is uh, uh, you know it is just not an impediment to my life. And and one of the challenges when I think about disability is it's inherently a set of multi-dimensional and continuous challenges in a particular social, economic, physical environment. And it just will never map easily into a sort of zero one determination that says you're disabled or you're not disabled in the way that say the, the two major US disability programs, SSI and SSDI require. And, and so we, we are sort of stuck in a world of binaries to talk about uh, inherently a multi-dimensional and continuous uh, thing. The, um, uh, it is, um, uh, I'll, get, I'll, I'll talk later, one of the central facts of my life is that I'm a family caregiver for a gentleman with intellectual disabilities. And I often think about his sense of health and well-being and the fact that his inner life is every bit as rich as my own inner life uh, in, and, and in a way that's so important to him. He, he likes to tell people that his, his career aspiration is to be the bartender at the Cheers bar. He loves the TV show Cheers. And what he means is, I want to have a job, you know, with really interesting, you know, fun, in, in, fun interactions with other people. And I want to be around glamorous actresses and actors and have a fun life and do, and do stuff. And, you know, have a challenging, interesting job. And, and uh, you know, that's... Uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, I think that, that it is uh, it's just such a profound thing that every human is trying to do that in our own individual way. And uh, I think I'll stop there and, um, and we'll pass it over to Colleen Grover. Okay. Do you want me to go? Or sure. Did you, um, yeah. Well, I mean, either way. Uh, we were going to switch, but I'm happy to go. Did you, uh, Professor? Maybe Professor uh, Grogan, you can go first. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Did I, did I do the wrong order? That's okay. We initially talked about having like China, U.S., China, U.S., but I, I don't think we need to be that rigid. Yeah. Okay. Paying attention was never my strength. <laughs> um, uh, so welcome, everybody, and um, thank you to, to both of you um, for, for your comments. Um, I, uh, I focus on um, political and social factors that structure healthcare systems, um, primarily in the US, but have also done some comparative work and, and thinking somewhat about the Chinese healthcare system. Um, and I do that because I think it's important to think about um, how we can reform health policies to improve well being. Um, to me, in that sense, health has to be very broadly defined um, because we not only need to think about the whole person, um, just as you were talking about, and that it's socially um, constructed, absolutely, um, but, that, um, but also that there are social, political, and environmental factors that impact a person's health and well-being. Um, so, this idea of health and well-being recognizes um, that systemic inequalities in a larger society impact individual health and well-being. Um, and in the U.S. context, this is called the social determinants of health. I think it's it's a fairly kind of it's become a more global, I think, uh, term as well. It really started in, in Britain first. Um, and in the US, we're really in just the beginning stages of thinking about um, how we can make investments in, in non-health goods or in the non-health, non-medical treatment areas to really um, have an even greater impact on individuals and community health. So just kind of expanding our notions of health and well-being from the individual to the community, I think, is, is also important. Um, and I just want to give perhaps one example in the US context. Um, the Medicaid program, which I have spent many years studying, um, is uh, the US healthcare program for, the, for poor and low income Americans also um, have these binary categorical definitions that Harold was referring to, uh, where people, um, 
that are disabled um, with the very strict definitions of that um, and low-income elderly are also eligible for the, the Medicaid program. Um, so it's, very, it's a very, very important program to think more broadly about the social, political, and environmental factors that impact um, people's well-being. Um, that program, uh, after, uh, after the ACA was passed, um, a number of states, as many of you uh, might be aware, um, had the opportunity to expand the Medicaid program. Uh, many states uh, took up that option, um, some did not, um, but now the vast majority of states do um, have expanded Medicaid. And what that meant is that for the first time in this program, um, the program included single um, adults, um, uh, non, single, you know, kind of non-parent Adults, um, which sounds crazy, but there were, you know, up until 2010, you uh, were only eligible for this program if you uh, were a parent with children. Um, so this expanded um, the program in really important ways, as uh, Ji Yang alluded to in her beginning remarks. Um, but it also brought in a, 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 a a, a group of people with a lot of social needs. Um, and, you know, we can talk more about that. Um, but for example, many um, homeless men that were never eligible for this program were now eligible. Um, and so in, the, in a number of states, um, it, it forced states to grapple with this question of, um, if we give um, homeless adults um, medical care, uh, without housing, is that really helpful? Uh, how, how much are we really making progress here on improving health and well-being? Um, and, uh, and I think the answer for many, if you really think about it, was that you really have to deal with, with uh, housing first uh, before you can really uh, address many of the um, health and other needs that people have. And so in a number of states now, they actually are, are using a healthcare program to focus on housing. And so I just want to say that this is, you know, it, when you think about the social policy side of health and well being, it expands quite dramatically, right? That, um, that we wouldn't just think about medical conditions or, um, uh, or medical treatments, but the whole social apparatus. Um, so I'll stop there. Fantastic. Um, so lastly, let's turn to Professor Lee. <coughs> Hi everyone. Uh, this I'm from Beijing. Uh, this is uh, early morning in the Beijing, so uh, very happy to have the chance to join this panel. The previous the panelists all gave the good definition of the health and the well-being. Uh, to end up, I think uh, uh, I think the uh, well-being, a human's well-being, very much depends on his or her health status. So if we're talking about a one or zero, I think a health is the one. Your career, your wealth, your family, all others are the zero. So without one, all the other zeros are the zero. It's no meaning. So in this sense, I think uh, to pursue a better world, uh, to pursue human beings' well-being, I think we need to build up an effective system to protect people's health. I just... Uh, End of this point. Okay. Um, so I think the next question um, is about um, initially what's your uh, approach to improve the health and well being as you defined, and what motivates you to work on this challenge? I think, in the interest of time, we, uh, not everyone has to answer this question. So, um, any volunteer? Well, maybe I can start. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, when I was a PhD student, I studied macroeconomics. That's, that was in the 90s in Pittsburgh. I graduated from University of Pittsburgh. But when you open the U.S. budget uh, table, you found out the Medicare and the Medicaid, these two accounts the number one U.S. government spending. So that attracted me to study the health, now I become a health economist. economist. I think uh, 
uh, in this modern society, with the technology improvement, with the living standard improve, uh, increasing, people's demands for a better health is uh, a rigid demand. So it's growing, especially now, now within, facing the uh, COVID-19. And uh, we know, you know, the health, health spending is continuing growing, but we have limited resources. Look at today, U.S. already spend over 19% of GDP on its health spending. China now is around less, little bit, you know, over 6%, around 7, you know, 6 to 7%, because I don't have the uh, 2020s data. But if we look at the outcome in 2020, Chinese life expectancy already exceeded the U.S. because of COVID-19. U.S. on average life expectancy decreased by 1.5. So now in, now, you know, China, we spend much less than the U.S. and we have a better health outcome. So I think, uh, you know, a better healthcare system is very important and that's need the scholar to start it. Yeah, I just talk about this. I guess I'll, I'll go next. Uh, I'll give a, my, some motivation from my work life and from my personal life. Uh, most of our, my work at the uh, Urban Health Lab is trying to f improve services for people who are at the boundary of the behavioral health, mental health system, and the criminal justice system, and particularly people who are at risk of having a violent encounter with police or other first responders. And sort of picking up on the point that Professor Grogan made, so many of the people that are at risk of these types of encounters are people that lack housing, whose basic needs are left unmet. Not just their healthcare needs, but their housing. You know, ba basic needs around social determinants. Uh, and then we, and, and we put so much, uh, and I must say we put such an unfair burden on the first responders very often to deal with the profound issues that people, uh, not just with serious mental illness, but also with addiction disorders and other things, you know, when, when, they, uh, when they present. And I often feel like if a first responder re deals poorly when someone has a behavioral health crisis, and there's a cell phone video of that. There's no cell phone video of the housing supports that that person never got that they should have gotten, or the times that they were trying to get help from systems that did not help them. And then on the, on the personal side, it is really striking being a caregiver for someone with an intellectual disability because you see both the, the progress in America and you also see where we fall short. I mean, it is, it is really amazing how much the United States has opened our hearts and our wallets to improve the lives of people with intellectual disabilities. And in our popular culture, uh, in everything. Uh, and, and that's something that I think many countries around the world could really learn from the United States in this particular issue domain on how much progress we've made. When my brother-in-law moved into our home, I was really worried that we would have, you know, local teenagers would be making obnoxious comments to us because he looks very unusual and so on. No, it does, doesn't happen. All, these, all of the young people in our community, they went to public school with people with intellectual disabilities. They are incredibly inclusive and humane. We, uh, around that. At the same time, we see many services, including Medicaid services, that higher income families such as ours are able to access actually more effectively than lower income families are because it's a very administratively complex system. And administrative complexity creates disparity because families that have social capital can navigate that more effectively. And so a lot of the disparities in America, some of them come up because we explicitly exclude poor people or people that we view as unworthy poor. Other disparities arise because we just have a very complex administrative system that responds much more effectively to organized uh, uh, and resourced groups of people. And so, so for me, uh, you know, when I see uh, how high-income families with, with our types of uh, family responsibilities are able to get services that our neighbors who have less resources are not able to get, that's a very powerful motivator. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Dr. Choi, would you like to say something? Yes. Um, as a disability studies scholar, um, so my research and, and teaching focuses more on naming, uh, conceptualization, uh, and how uh, they affect 
public awareness of disability, um, uh, system construction, um, and uh, rights protection. Um, so I think uh, many of us probably know that in this country, um, it takes years for people with intellectual disabilities to get rid of the word, R word, retardation. And uh, for the simple reason that they think it's disrespectful and they challenge their human dignity and they don't like to be called this way, but um, we think it's very easy. This change should come quickly, but that's not the case. And it happens in other countries as well. So naming and conceptualization, they have profound impact on health and disability because health and disability, they're like shadows to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so that's um, my focus. And uh, um, I think um, when people with disabilities, um, they have a voice in society and they are present, they are participating in all the decision-making process. Um, our society will be a much better place for that diversity to thrive and to have their own places. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I just, I wanted to kind of respond a little bit to um, Professor Lee because um, I think I also share the same motivations initially for wanting to study um, health policy in the U.S. healthcare system, that um, it has such severe inequalities, um, and we spend so much and get so little. Um, so that's been a problem for a very long time. It's not a new problem. I, I got my doctorate in the 1980s, <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it goes way back. So, um, so that really motivated me to get into this field. Um, but I think what also motivates me now is recognizing that, um, that it's, it's, there's a political problem in the US. So it's, it's, not, it, it, it's not just the comparison to China. You can compare the US to so many other countries. And we are the most expensive and have um, comparatively very poor outcomes. Um, most Americans, I think, agree with this, um, that this is a problem. Most, I think, would like to have universal coverage. Most would like to um, have better value for the money. Um, but we have a politically constructed system in which um, the interest groups within that system are, are, are favored. Um, so I think the other motivation that I have is um, just trying to create a more inclusive um, democratic decision-making process for health policy, um, and that we're not really going to have change um, until we address um, some of these um, inequitable political problems um, in the system. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you so much. And I think like in terms of inclusion and how to make inclusion happen, I imagine in the discussion uh, time we will have a lot of uh, uh, conversations about, for example, including people with disabilities in um, healthcare decision making, things like that. Um, but I think I want to uh, ask the third question, which Professor Lee uh, has already kind of brought up, that is COVID-19. Um, it's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, so, I mean, as COVID-19 challenges the health and well-being around the world, um, I want to ask like specifically to the population that you are working with, you each are working with, what challenges has COVID-19 posed to this particular population and how should those challenges be addressed? Um, perhaps we could start with, um, who hasn't started first? Colleen. Colleen. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, I. So I'm, I'm going to start with the, the concern that I think is was most stark in the U.S. context, um, which is the racial inequalities. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we all knew that um, systemic racism in the healthcare system and in society more broadly was a, well, I shouldn't say we all knew, I think, I, I wish we all knew, but that that was a serious problem. I think the, most people in this room know that that is a serious concern in the U.S. context. Um, but it became very, very starkly apparent, um, of course, during the pandemic. Um, 
And that's uh, really for two reasons. One, um, you know, people of color were more likely to be frontline workers, um, which Harold, I think, alluded to a little bit, um, and therefore, um, you know, were more exposed to COVID, and um, people of color have higher rates of chronic disease, and therefore were more susceptible to severe cases of COVID and higher rates of mortality. Um, so, um, I think what COVID really brought home more so than ever for many of us who study in the US healthcare system um, is the need to address systemic racism um, in the healthcare system, but also um, systemic racism in the larger society. And again, kind of back to that notion that um, um, it impacts um, the social determinants of health. Uh, I could say more about that, but I'll stop. Okay, thank you. And um, maybe I could ask, Professor Lee, do you want to add something? Although you have spoken about this a little bit. Okay, yeah, China actually is the first, well, last January, we, we were the first one to encounter this new virus. So at the beginning, yeah, the whole country is at a panic. But I think China has done a great job to anti this COVID-19. The government put people's health as the top priority. So when we don't know, you know, what the, uh, what the way to control these diseases, but we first lock down and let people slow, you know, to not say, I know this is the traditional way to control the uh, diseases, control the source of infection, cut the root of transmission. So uh, with the collective action and uh, we control the the pandemic uh, within three months. Up to now, actually, you know, China, given China is 1.4 billion people, uh, the, uh, the confirmed uh, case is only 127,000. And uh, the people died is around 5,700. So this uh, is the lowest rate. And uh, after three months, our economy, social, all com completely recovered. So last year, China is the, was the only country that economic growth, it was positive. And also we provide a lot of experience resources to outside of China, especially the vaccine. Right now, we already send out over 20 billion vaccine to the other countries to help people to prevent the pandemic. So I China's experience, I think it's, it's valuable to the other country. Uh, I think we need a collective actions. You know, all the economists, you know, are, I'm studying economics, so we all think when everybody maximize your own utility, then end up the social welfare will be the biggest, but uh, we think this anti-COVID-19, I think we need a collective way. And then the human society can control this pandemic. Yeah, I just say this. Maybe next we can turn to Professor uh, Pollack. Well, you know, COVID is such, it's, it's a challenge and it's a mirror uh, in the society. And so many of the strengths and weaknesses of both the United States and China were, were on full display during the COVID uh, during the COVID challenge, uh, certainly in the in the uh, and and both have great accomplishments and great failures that uh, that that should give us a sense of humility uh, 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 as we deal with that. The um, in, in the addiction work that I do, one of the biggest challenges is that uh, you know the opioid epidemic has really become much more profound in the United States. And in general, addictions we have a problem. People are sitting at home; they're bored. They lose a lot of the social control that they would have if they were having to go out to work every day. And you're sort of sitting at home with your liquor cabinet and whatever else might be there at home. And we see, you know, really some addictive behaviors have really become a greater challenge. We, have a, we had 100,000 opioid deaths in 2020 in the United States. That's, that's more than the combined total of all the gun deaths, all the traffic fatalities, and, and with a lot more left over. You know, that is just a profound profound challenge. The, uh, in the realm of disability, uh, the people with intellectual disabilities have just really suffered under COVID for two very important sets of reasons. One is people have distinctive vulnerabilities. People with Down syndrome 
I have very, very serious medical vulnerabilities to COVID and have many times the mortality rate of, 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 other, of other people uh, because for, for medical reasons. And also, disability services pretty much collapsed. Uh, direct care workers are very low paid, very high rates of vaccine hesitance among the direct care workers that, that I have come into contact with, partly which reflects distrust of the healthcare system and, their, and the disrespectful way that we have treated direct care workers uh, in the United States. A lot of people that I talked to said, you know, I'm getting very low pay. Uh, I, I'm not being respected or consulted about the conditions of my work. You want me to get vaccinated to protect your loved one against COVID. I'm nervous about the vaccine and I've had no voice in, in this process. And you know what? I don't, it's not that I'm anti-vaccine, but I'm not ready to be vaccinated yet. I don't, and if you don't like that, why don't you just find somebody else who's willing to do my direct care job for less than they pay people at McDonald's? And, and so an unvaccinated care worker actually walked COVID into my brother-in-law's group home and, and, and someone was very seriously infected. And uh, so COVID has been uh, a very difficult challenge to a lot of people with disabilities. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there, but th those are two things that struck me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Dr. Tsui? Yes, during the COVID time, we all know that, um, you know, we started working from home, learning from home, and we started experiencing isolation. Um, but um, I hope this um, experience will help us to understand that people, many people with disabilities, this is their normal life for the lifespan. Um, I hope this situation the challenge will increase of our understanding of their situation. And people with disabilities might think that, you know, in a humorous way, welcome to the club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is our life. And uh, for the population I serve, I think lack of data um, and the representation of their experience on the media is a huge challenge. And uh, we probably see more of the government campaign and actions to combat the COVID, but we see very little representation of people with disabilities and how they are doing um, on the media uh, in society. So we uh, we probably want to improve uh, that. And also, um, when there is a report um, on COVID and disability is probably more focused on um, the society's action rather than how people with disabilities feel about it. Um, that's probably some of the challenges we see. Thank you so much. And thank you all for sharing um, your work and wisdom. I could sit here all day and ask all my questions. But um, in the interest of time, I would like to open the floor for the audience members to ask questions. Um, anyone was at? Thank you for the great discussion. Um, my name is Chuan Fen, and I'm a graduate student from Harris School of Public Policy. Um, I was a social worker in rural Missouri. I have seen a lot of uh, medical abuse. So my question is how to curb the medical abuse um, from a policy level while we still provide the health care uh, for those people in need. Thank you. Do you want to address, uh, ask this question to a particular speaker or anyone? Um, everybody. <laughs> what, view, what views? I'm sorry. Uh, the, how to curb the Medicaid abuse. Oh, Medicaid abuse. Yes. Oh, OK. Um, so I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Um, I, I guess. Um, because I, 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 what I think is that um, we shouldn't, we, 
my hope is that Medicaid becomes a stepping stone to something closer to universal coverage and that we don't have these sort of artificial demarcations of a means test. Um, and so if it's sort of abuse because people are hiding funds and they, therefore they become eligible when they're not as poor as they say they are, I'm less concerned about that because I want us to get rid of those demarcations anyway, to be honest with you. Um, I do think that there are a number, some people have called it elder abuse um, of, of the Medicaid program, so a number of people that have means will um, hide their assets so that they can um, become, uh, get on Medicaid in a to have nursing home coverage. Um, and, and that's, as I said, been called elder abuse. Um, uh, that middle class elderly are, are taking advantage of the Medicaid program. Again, to me, the way to flip that around and to, to, to have a different view on that is to ask um, middle class families, there's, no, there's a couple things. One, um, if they tried to save for long term care, they couldn't possibly do it because it is much too expensive. It's $70,000 a year for nursing home care. Um, so they, they can't pay out of pocket. Um, number two, um, most people think that Medicare, our Medicare program, our healthcare program for the elderly, covers long-term long care. So when they end up needing long-term care, they actually don't realize until it happens that they don't already have coverage. So part of their lack of savings, even if they could, is because there's a misunderstanding about, and, and that's not, uh, to me that's not uh, um, blameworthy because we have a very, very complicated and fragmented healthcare system so that it is very easy to misunderstand um, coverage and you know what's covered in what program and what's covered in another. Um, so really, I think we need a long-term care uh, program for Americans where we would all pay into it. Um, we're all at risk for needing long-term care and only the top 1% could really afford long-term care. So it's a perfect thing for social insurance to cover, to be honest with you. Um, so I don't know if Harold or you want to well, chime in on, on Medicaid abuse, but I'll that just, would be my reaction. Um, let, let me add one, one thing to what Professor Grogan just said. Uh, I mean, the Medicaid is, is such a complicated program and there's different types of abuse that one could be referring to uh, by by different stakeholders. And there's, you know, there's, certainly there's fraud in every program that, that 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 would you know that that may require uh, additional auditing or whatever. In, in terms of what Professor Rogan was just saying, Medicaid has a limit, a two thousand dollar limit on your countable assets. That's your money that you have in the bank, you, uh, you know your wealth, your financial wealth. It was last raised in 1989. If it were at the level that it was in the early 1970s, it would be about ten thousand dollars. That is a ridiculously low limit that you, it basically says like if you own, and your home is excluded from that, the value of your home is excluded, but you can't keep a strategic reserve if, if you know, your boiler bursts or your car breaks down, something like that. So what happens is families cannot live within that $2,000 limit in a real human way. And, and very often people are tempted to do things to work around that limit that are fraudulent in terms of the rules of the program, uh, but that are trying to, because the program has not allowed people in a legitimate way to meet their needs. And so one of the things that we could do in Medicaid, if we just raise that countable asset limit to a realistic level, it would be easier for people to, to be Medicaid recipients with integrity when they have some of these long-term care needs. Uh, and, and so I, I think that's one aspect, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know if, I don't know if uh, if anyone else wants to uh, to comment as well. I mean, I think maybe the broader question is you, you always, if you have a means tested limited program, then it always raises these these questions about fraud and abuse. You can't kind of get away from that. Um, and that might be the argument for social insurance, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. But um, I don't know if either but one of you wanted be, to. That uh, even more challenging um, when you talk about people with intellectual disabilities and uh, um, how Medicaid is used um, to serve the population, so that will be another <laughs> big topic. But one, one of the ironies of this is that if you're a well-resourced parent with, a, say, a child with an intellectual disability, you can actually figure out how to, how to comply with program rules mm -hmm. and get around that asset limit through there's something called ABLE accounts that allow you to have actually a couple hundred thousand dollars of assets for the expenses of your 
of your child or your loved one. Uh, if you ask people who are on Medicaid, if you ask family caregivers, most people do not know that this program exists. The people who know this program exists are people who can hire lawyers and accountants and people who can navigate this program in a sophisticated way. And this is one, one of many examples where complexity creates disparity. As a high-income parent, you're, you can actually not cheat the program in terms of, you can, you can comply with its formal rules because you have the capacity to get expert help to comply with those rules. Other parents may actually do something that is against the rules of Medicaid. They're trying to do the same thing you're doing, but they're just less sophisticated because they don't have that expert help and how to do that in a way that is legally in compliance with the program. And, and, uh, and, and that's, a real, that's a, one of the ironies of, of the American Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. um, so this question, I guess, was um, largely uh, about the U.S. situation. So I want to ask if the audience, um, any, anyone has a, the next question that is more about China or comparative. Oh, there are too many hands. Mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, you? Could, uh, the mic is coming to you. Hello, uh, I'm Ling Ming Fu, a uh, first year PhD student at Crown Family School. So uh, thank you so much all for a great uh, insightful uh, panel discussion. My question uh, is about like the digital divide. One consequence of like, the COVID-19 is like we start to raise our attention to like the digital divide. I'm wondering uh, uh, how has uh, the digital divide has it, uh, affected like the population you are studying? Yeah, both in the US and in, yeah, in China, yeah. So, uh, okay, <clears throat> maybe I can uh, start first. Actually, China this time, you know, to uh, uh, anti the COVID, we uh, adopted a very active way. Uh, you know, the traditional Chinese medicine, the lockdown, the big data. Every Chinese people has a, a healthy uh, data. We go everywhere. You need to scan that uh, have you know scan your your uh, mobile phone to get the permit to get in, and uh, so the medical devices also are very popular used because the lockdown we have a lot of online you know consultation uh, diagnoses uh, and uh, almost everything moved to online. So uh, the portable devices you know you can remotely. To uh, con uh, to measure your blood pressure, your uh, that you know the the all the other uh, uh, diagnoses. So this uh, is popularly used in China, but the Chinese government now is trying to enact the law because it's need uh, governance uh, needs the uh, the standards. So this is moving on, moving on. I think uh, with the technology improvement, uh, the healthcare and uh, the system, the method uh, will have a big change. Yeah, I just uh, stop here. Thank you. Maybe you can sure. You first? Um, so I will talk from the uh, accessibility, you know, perspective, because the uh, digital device. Um, if it doesn't have very good accessible uh, functions, and uh, it's probably not going to be helpful for people with disabilities, with different disabilities, with vision impairments and hearing impairments. Uh, during the COVID time, if we want to use, for example, if uh, right now, um, during the COVID time, when we had many uh, appointments with uh, doctors, uh, we can show the video on and have video um, you know, meetings with those doctors, um, but it can be a challenge for people with uh, disabilities, with vision impairments and hearing impairments to um, arrange those uh, meetings and also get treatments, so yeah. And yeah, thank you. And I would just quickly chime in to say that um, one is that uh, China, um, I guess COVID, what, COVID has shown people is the importance to develop telehealth in China, right? Whereas here, people are uh, in the past year and a, almost two years have been very much adapted to um, using telehealth approaches to get care. Um, in China, it's still very much sort of like being developed. But in this process, we definitely do need to think about 
both in terms of um, people's capacity to um, access in terms of, for example, age divide, but also like in terms of class divide, access to um, different technologies. And also um, in China, um, one of the effective ways to uh, control COVID is now everywhere you go, as Professor Lee mentioned, you need to show a health code, um, which is uh, attached to your either your WeChat or your Alipay account. But um, for a lot of uh, age, the, the aging population, using that has been quite a challenge. And it has taken the government quite a long time to figure out how to use alternative ways mm -hmm. to, um, uh, to uh, sort of like for, for this population to get through these checkpoints. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wonder about the US experience. What, uh, what do you see as a digital divide, uh, especially in the COVID area in era in terms of health? Yeah, um, I mean, you mentioned um, telehealth, which is the most important um, area in my mind in terms of um, the thinking about the digital divide. I, I, I think that it's it, it's been somewhat encouraging and discouraging from my understanding. Um, it's, this isn't exactly the area I studied, but I think, and Harold mentioned, substance use disorder has gone way up during COVID as well as um, depression. And um, luckily, uh, appointments for um, addiction um, and for uh, mental health um, treatment um, has also really gone up with telemedicine. That's been one of the areas that was most amenable to telemedicine. So I think that um, that actually has been a really encouraging sign coming from COVID is that telehealth seems to work quite, we, we think, I don't think it works as equally well for all people with substance use disorder and mental, mental health um, concerns, but, um, uh, but it does work well for a good number of people. So I don't think we're going to turn, the clock isn't going to turn back on telehealth. I think it's going to continue to increase. If I could just add, yeah, and there, there are some real key advantages to telehealth. Partly people with physical mobility challenges can get services through telehealth that they were, that people, people would, uh, would have to schlep down to the University of Chicago Medical Center or something, which might be difficult if they have a mobility challenge for something that could be done now through telehealth. There are some people who have mental and behavioral health issues who prefer the telehealth modality. I don't have to sit in the embarrassing waiting room for, uh, you know, to see my counselor for whatever my issue is. I can do that via telehealth. There are people who, who prefer that. The digital divide has been quite challenging in education for students with various learning challenges. And there's, there's no question that uh, that, that, that video, that, that's when schools closed, that, that the disparities between, uh, that there were uh, large groups of students with educational needs who did not do well in the, you know, on Zoom, and that we, and some of the educational disparities have really increased because of, because of some of those realities. So I think, I think it's a, you can't sort of give a, you can't give a uniform thumbs up or thumbs down to some of these technology changes, but I do think that there's some things that we can take from the growth of telehealth that will be helpful. Thank you. And um, we pro have time for one to two questions, I think. So maybe this gentleman over there. Yeah. I'm Michael Massal, and I'm the co-director of the Kennedy Research Center on Intellectual Disability. I have three points of emphasis. I was a consultant to Special Olympics in the late 1980s. And because uh, Deng's son uh, became paraplegic, China in the early 90s started a lot of emphasis on accessibility and also collaborated with Special Olympics. I know that's gone even further since the 1990s. I think the statement that Harold made about the importance of Medicaid for adult individuals with disabilities is incredibly true, but it is such a fragmented and negative system. I have a sister who's 51 who required her heart surgery during COVID. She went through the operation and was ready to go home in three days. 
Medicaid said that it would take them at least 20 days to find a personal care assistant or a visiting nurse because her only disability after the open heart surgery because she had her chest cracked, she couldn't shampoo, and she couldn't do upper extremity dressing. But Medicaid claimed that she had to stay in the hospital 27 more days at a cost of several thousand dollars a day. And the problem is there's no transparency in the inefficiencies of Medicaid. After going around and around, my brother and I said, that's why we have a trust fund and we got her home in one day. We saved the state of Illinois hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they don't care. And so I point this out because it is dysfunctional in very important ways. The most important thing to recognize, and Harold pointed it out, is that there are vulnerabilities for individuals of color. Freddie Gray of Baltimore City was a 28-week, 12-week early, 900-gram preemie whose sister died. Freddie had a lead level of 35, which is seven times abnormal, at age two. Freddie never got any community services, and at 10, was discovered as reading at a first grade level. Freddie being arrested in his 20s and broke his larynx and broke his neck in a police violence encounter cost the city of Baltimore multi-millions of dollars. But I would point out that the city of Baltimore wasted social capital and wasted preventive opportunities waiting for this to come. We could go through, as Harold says, a lot of people in criminal justice, and they have not been well served by some of the behavioral health and developmental supports that they need. That's not to say, oh, everybody should be let off, but it is a very fragmented and chaotic and troubling system and we don't know what to do about it in the United States. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are running out of time. So uh, why don't we all, like, um, each person uh, say maybe spend 30 seconds, um, either in response to the gentleman's comment or as a concluding remark. Um, maybe, Dr. Sue, you can start first. Uh, so you mentioned uh, Special Olympics. I am a big fan of uh, Special Olympics. I've been traveling around the world to participate Special Olympics events um, as an expert. Um, so my comment is that because this event is held at a university, and how, uh, as a university, how we think about um, the best ways to serve the population we're talking about today. I, I think there's a huge gap between the achievements of research and their translation into practice to improve the lives of people with disabilities. And um, I think universities should do more uh, for this to happen and should include more people with disabilities to take leadership roles in those. Thank you. And maybe Professor Prolek? Yeah, I, I think I'm glad that you mentioned universities. I think that we have such an important role to play. One of the most important roles we can actually play is by being completely transparent. You know, we are we, we are the most important academic medical center in 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 our city, uh, or certainly in this part of the city. Uh, and we are not as kind as we should be to Medicaid recipients. And much of the blame for that actually goes to the state of Illinois for the way that Medicaid is such a pays us such a low reimbursement rate and is so unprofessional in dealing with our hospital. Uh, but I think as a leading institution, we, we, we should be transparent about, about the ways that we ourselves are, create disparities. And we saw during COVID, uh, so many people ended up in community hospitals in the south side of Chicago in ICUs, intensive care units, 
uh, which had much higher mortality rates than the University of Chicago's did over some very basic issues around staffing and resources, and, and that led to deaths. And, uh, and I think as, as uh, this is such a precious institution that I'm so proud to be a part of, uh, but I, I would like to see us speak more frankly about, about our role in some of these disparities and what would have to change in public policy so that we, we could more fully embrace people with disabilities and low-income patients who would benefit from uh, the medical services that we provide. Mm -hmm. um, next, Professor Lee. Yeah, the COVID has the changed the world. I think uh, uh, as an uh, uh, academia university, we need to play more important role. I think on uh, one hand is uh, we need to provide the uh, right suggestions to the government for the public policy to protect the people's health. And also we need to provide the right information to the public. And because the academia, government, society, and the individual cooperate together, then we can overcome this pandemic. Krogan? Yeah, just um, really just echo what Professor Lee just said. I mean, I, I think one of the, the biggest concerns about the U.S. healthcare system um, is is, is kind of reflected in COVID, right? So there, there are many um, inequities within the system. Um, and um, and I think the distrust of the problem is, uh, I think government um, does need more authority to create a more equitable system, but there is a lot of distrust among the American people of the US government. And so it creates a very um, difficult challenge um, within our society. I think it's one that I hope we can achieve, but I think you're right. It's a collaboration between, we have a number of private institutions and private actors. Uh, we have universities in the healthcare system and we have um, a role for government. And unless we get those three kind of working on the same page, um, it's gonna be hard to, to enact change. Thank you so much for all the wonderful comments and discussions. Um, so we'll turn the floor to the next panel. <laughs>